Without question, this whole area of, of, of blockchain, cryptocurrencies, tokenization, so forth, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I find it to be wildly overwhelmed with uh, <laughs> some people who know what they're doing and some people who like to talk like they know what they're doing. And I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk with a bunch of people that I think know what they're doing uh, and this should be really illuminating. If you don't mind, uh, what I would ask, and this will be the only time in the whole panel where we do the birds on a wire routine. You know, have you ever been the panel? It's like, you go down and it's just, oh my God, after three times down, it's like watching people play the xylophone or whack-a-mole. But for this one, if you don't mind, uh, I'd like you to introduce yourselves to the audience and importantly, give some context for why you're excited about being here and what you do on a daily basis and how it, it fits together with the topics we're gonna to discuss. And then, and then we'll spring out from there with some questions that were prepared earlier and are being held in a, in a room by Ernst and Young. They'll be bringing them out shortly uh, and we'll start. Elizabeth, I'll start with you. Hi everybody, I'm Elizabeth Stahl. I work for IBM and I work with clients all over the world consulting on topics emerging technologies such as blockchain, hybrid cloud, pervasive encryption. And I work mostly with blockchain on use cases, best practices across all different types of industries. And I'm really excited to be here because I think it's important. One of the biggest challenges I see when I work with clients is sometimes there's the confusion between um, cryptocurrencies and an enterprise like blockchain. So I like to come and, and discuss that and make sure that people know that I believe that there's no industry that won't be helped by blockchain. Hello, I'm Fanny. I work at the World Bank. Um, I specialize on uh, looking at applications of blockchains in supply chains to make them more efficient and fairer for small suppliers and women like groups especially. Um, so we recently launched a, uh, an initiative uh, which is uh, actually going to uh, be composed of a prototype or report in a workshop uh, looking at three main areas which I think are very relevant to this panel and interesting um, exciting. Um, the first one is looking at how we can use blockchain to integrate certain regulations within smart contracts uh, to help SMEs access international normal markets more easily. Um, the second one is how can we possibly use blockchain to build identities for suppliers so they can access credit more efficiently. Um, and the third one, how could we possibly use blockchain to make uh, supply chain more efficient and less costly by removing some of the legal men. Hi everyone, I'm Dan Goldstein. I teach technology entrepreneurship at Georgetown. I'm an entrepreneur by uh, background. Um, I'm currently a fellow at a think tank called New America, and we have a couple of different blockchain practices within New America. Uh, my primary area of research at the moment is blockchain for social good, and I've been looking a lot at applications of blockchain in the developing world in the global south. Uh, also in New America, we have a program called the Blockchain Trust Accelerator, which is a partnership between uh, New America, the National Democratic Institute, and the Fury Group, and we have a number of other partners as well. And we are uh, bringing together pilots for social good blockchain uh, projects that involve the uh, civil society, involve governments, involve private actors. And uh, with that, it's bigger time. Um, so my name is, is a sign this one. Lisa. Okay, uh, I'm Charlie Kaiser. I'm the CEO of Atlas Cloud Enterprises, a chain traded cryptocurrency mining operation and blockchain company in Canada based on the CSE. Um, I'm also an advisor to Loki. John Wise was on a panel earlier, so I'm also an advisor to another uh, company called Build One X. Um, I'm here because I helped take the first uh, Bitcoin and blockchain company public in a reverse merger back in 2014. We invested across the space. Um, we started that as an e-commerce play. Uh, we actually went public in the big month, but uh, now God has actually went through its, uh, its unique history. Um, and we invested in uh, payment processors, ATM network networks. Um, digital uh, coin retailers, as well as our own industrial mining facility back in 2014. Okay, hello everybody. Um, my name is Jim Liu. I'm a co-founder of SoCat. It's the number one machine learning AI and blockchain technology company. Named after my- He says daughter. humbly. <laughs> number one, right? Let's see how I'm marketing. Uh, this is my attempt at marketing. Uh, so it's named after my two daughters, Sophie and Catherine. And uh, you know, we, we work with um, agencies and asset managers and um, sort of you know, academic institutions. My day job is uh, teaching at Johns Hopkins Business School. And so right now I'm teaching the uh, Big Data Machine Learning course. And also I'm teaching uh, mergers and acquisitions. In the fall, we'll be offering a uh, blockchain 
uh, course. So, you know, I'm here to try to find some speakers to come to class and sort of share some insights and so forth. So I'm looking forward to participating on this panel. Is there any truth that you pay thousands of dollars for your guest speakers to come to your class? <laughs> Well, I, I don't know that. Maybe, maybe some Bitcoins or Ethereum. Ether. Bitcoin, okay. All right, well, I'm, I'm glad to see that we're dealing in a real currency. That's good. <laughs> I thought that where we would begin, it, I, I'll tell you, I, I was struck a couple weeks ago. I was reading, um, I think it was, uh, I'm, I'm a recovering lawyer. I stopped practicing a long time ago now, but I still get legal uh, periodicals sent to me from time to time. And there was one talking about the emerging trend of state legislatures trying to manage and regulate blockchain. And it's sort of like, for me, I was watching a bunch of legislators trying to define blockchain. It's, it's like asking a bunch of cavemen to define thermodynamics. I just, it just, but it did really call out to me that I'm not really sure that there really, at least from where I sit, there exists a universal definition of blockchain. That's what it feels to me. Uh, and I was wondering whether or not that was something you all felt or if there was a commonality. Because as I listen to all of you introduce yourselves, it's always, I love doing panels like this where I have people introduce themselves. It sometimes seems a little bit awkward, but it's always better to see what people think is relevant, you know? And what I thought was fascinating from the way you all introduce yourself is you're all involved in using blockchain with very different use cases. So what's the commonality? So I was asked a couple years ago, and it was still relatively new, or th three years ago, could I talk about blockchain and say it in three sentences? And I said, I can do better than that. I can say it in three words. So anyone want to guess what it is? It's not all property is theft. <laughs> no, I use um, distributed general ledger. I mean, because that basically, in my mind, covers everything. You go back to your accounting classes, you think about the ledger. And whether it's financial, whether it's assets you're talking about, that's what it is in a nutshell. Everyone can understand. That's what I use. What do you guys think? Is that how you describe it? Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, it's more than the precise definition. It's important to understand what we expect from it and how we frame blockchain as we talk about the use cases. Um, and I think it's helpful to frame it um, as a sort of a three headed tool um, a social tool, a business tool, and a political tool. And I feel like it's not one of these goals, it's not the three goals separately, it's really these three goals that are interlinked and mutually reinforcing. Um, so I think I'll just give a brief example of the copies of blockchain. Um, there's like 25 million small and farmers producing coffee around the world. Uh, it's an 8 billion market, and there's three companies that um, monopolize this, this market. Blockchain could change this in social terms, with the social goals by providing more equality, through more transparency with supply chain, more shared revenues. But to do that, you need it to be a business, to have a business goal for companies to accept, uh, to, to actually implement it. Um, and that's simplified logistics, and it can also be a political tool, because it changes the social contract uh, between by creating a direct link between the customer and the supplier. So it's very rare to have a technology that's the three of these tools. And I think when we talk about blockchain, it's important to remember uh, these three goals. Before we go to the use cases of the social application, what I'm getting at, for example, is I spoke to a bunch of people who have said to me, blockchain is not just a data distribution or data integrity technology. Blockchain must have an open source aspect to it, or blockchain must, I mean, you know, people in, so are there other attributes that are universally expected in blockchain, or are we really talking at the most elemental, you know, is the common core code really that's a distributed data technology? I mean, that's really what I, I want to start there, because I think the use cases are incredibly interesting, and I want to get there, but let's make sure we've got a common definition first. What are the so I, uh, I honestly struggle to come up with a definition that is kind of universally accessible. Um, my father-in-law asks me every time we get together to find blockchain for him, and I've not yet done it successfully. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, one analogy that, that I've heard um, is just sort of looking at where blockchain is at the moment. Um, you know, if you think about sort of 1993 and where the internet was, we're at a similar stage in terms of the development of blockchain now. Do you need to understand what TCP IP is? to really understand how the internet works and how it can benefit you? No, I don't, I don't think so. So does everybody necessarily need to have a, a robust understanding of what is happening cryptographically and what's happening technolo technologically with blockchain? 
I don't know that everybody necessarily does. What I think is important is to understand the benefits of blockchain more than the features of blockchain. And from where I sit, what is important about blockchain is that it uses complex technology to provide transparency, security, and accountability. And that has a lot of use cases. And Dana, I just wanted to add, I totally agree with you because uh, what I do when I meet with a client before we even get into technology is we look at their business case and their return on investment, right? And you look at you know what their as is process now compared to what it might be with blockchain. So you're so right on with that. When I look at, at what you're involved in now, uh, you you know you've been involved in, in mining, you know the sort of the what I would say is I think a lot of people when they think about Bitcoin these days think about it as as a public, you know, a, a public database that's self-healing because a lot of people have responsibility for maintaining data integrity. It's an outsourced, almost crowdsourced kind of thing. And I think a lot of people when they think about Bitcoin, think about it in the context of tokens or, or currencies or some medium of exchange that sits on top of a lot of these. You know, you're involved in this various ways. Is, is that a comprehensive definition or are we really still talking about a database or, da or a data, you know, a data storage methodology. Well, I think it's you know decentralized ledger, right? Is is a great place to start. Okay. I'd add to that that you know the fundamental kind of white paper on Bitcoin basically put out there that there's also a reward system. Basically, enough people saying that they'll take these things, like the first couple of them, like for a pizza, right? Mm -hmm. And so now you've got uh, a reward system because there's uh, value because enough people traded it, right? Commodities folks and everybody else got in and started trading this thing. Mm. Um, so from a mining perspective. You know, I, I go back to just explaining it to people using actually the classic kind of deed uh, example in the United States. We actually have a, a, a blockchain system already. It's been around for a long time, which is our deed system. And you mean real country. estate? Yeah, real estate, right? So, so what, what happens, right? You, you're, you go to buy a house and your attorney in the title company goes and looks grantor, grantee, grantor, grantor, as far back as they can go to like a land grant. It says, okay, this title's clean, mm -hmm. right? So imagine if you call up your, your, law, your lawyer or your title company and they wanted to do it and say, well, before I can verify your title, I've got to verify every piece of property in the United States, like all the way back to the beginning of time, and then I can do yours, right? So the blockchain and the hashing algorithms are effectively doing that type of thing in a very complex way, verifying all these transactions. So our mining facilities and everybody else is doing mining is, is just verifying stuff over and over. And that adds the complexity and the degree of security to that, right? But instead of a, a, a AWS or someone holding data that is not going to verify, it could be a distributed ledger of mining systems uh, around the globe. So one of the things that I'm looking at and, and the industry is looking at is the pushback on Gosh, how much power is taking, you know, is using to kind of do the proof of work, not proof of stake, but proof of work coins, right? Mm -hmm. That are out there and Bitcoin's one of those. Mm -hmm. So we're, you know, we're looking at, okay, what would it be like to disintermediate escrow and storage of data? And how much power is AWS and everybody else using to, to store information compared to the amount of power that, say, cryptocurrency miners are using to start with the innovation phase of this right now? Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I'd, what I'd add to that is, I think it's a challenge to explain it to people, um, but I like the deed reference, which is, you know, if you had to ask your lawyer to go and do that, it would be quite expensive, but in a complex area like uh, cryptocurrency mining, mm. it's already happened, right? Mm. And the fundamental security in that is that, as everybody's saying, how do we put stuff on a blockchain that can be secured? And then where's the business, va business value kind of derive out of that? We're kind of still at the early stage right now. So does a mining function, uh, is that an example of, of uh, a commonality, which is that for blockchain to really work uh, in, in a, the right use cases, there needs to be some group of people that are incentivized to maintain da date yes. integrity? Yeah, that's, that's kind of a very fundamental kind of core of that, is that the incentive in, in, in Bitcoin's case is that you're awarded uh, a Bitcoin, which, which now has value because enough people trade them. You know, why does a Pokemon card have value? Because there's a... There's a laser on the top, and there's a, re a reason that, that, that this cardboard is made, and it's a certain asset, and I can verify that this Pokemon card has value. But enough people just trade it. So, so far what I'm hearing then is that Bitcoin is a unique um, data storage technology that is distributed, and that has significant meaning because it means that there's not just one instance of the database, which means that if cyber hackers decide to go in and try to screw with one set of data, it doesn't matter anymore because it's self-replicating and it's self-reinforcing. But it sounds to me so far, before I, I get to uh, Jim and he screws this all up, <laughs> I'm not saying not with your AI, but, but seriously, so far what I'm hearing is that distributed database 
And it's self-healing largely because within uh, uh, the community, almost like an open source community, there are a group of people who are incentivized in some way to maintain data integrity by operating within this ecosystem. And no, there's no centralized big brother correcting data. It's happened on a distributed basis. And the last thing I'd add to that is that um, in, its, in its innovation phase, right, which is we're still at the you know, first wave, right? Uh, there have been ups and downs, right? So the, the folks that are maintaining the code for this have gone through forks, right? The idea that there's some vulnerability or some discovery that has affected uh, the, the integrity of the system. I'm to very lean and high level terms here. And so they have to change the algorithm to basically reflect some sort of closing of a gap of security. So that's one of the things that's still being worked on, right? So how many people agree that this is what I want to support and do, and the next people say, well, I think we really ought to go this way, and so you sort of bifurcate that out. So we do have a couple of those things happening, right? And that's with how Bitcoin Cash and a few other hmm. newer coins based on the Bitcoin algorithm have, have evolved. So but it's a little more complex, but that's, that's one of the challenges, right? Is how do, you, how do you solve those problems in an innovation phase of this? But I just want to you know, point out that we need to make sure we keep the definition broad enough to not just focus on the crypto piece, right? So the permission side, the enterprise side, the following the manufacturing line or the supply chain, whatever kind of you know, application that we use. So it's not necessarily the crypto permission right. side. Right. And, and I, think that's, I, I think that's right. I mean, I think, for example, Google is planning on using this uh, for in, internal data, data storage purposes, for example. And you get to clarify, that was really just responding to Yeah. Right. Why, what I'm trying to get at is here's the thing. I'm old enough to remember, sadly, I, when dinosaurs ruled the earth, but right after that when Al Gore invented the internet and right after that to, uh, to Dana's point about uh, you know we really are I think uh, in, in, an, in 1993 internet land maybe 1994 uh, and I was involved in the venture industry then first a venture lawyer then as an investor and the level of, of misinformation that existed you know around what the web could be or what it was how it worked uh, frankly I think it wasted a lot of money and a lot of people's time and so I'm, I'm really, I, bluntly, I think that the idea of distributed data that it can withstand wanton destruction and is survivable, that is maintained by people pursuing their own economic interests is probably the most powerful thing that's happened since the printing press. That's just me, okay? So I, I wanna see this get off to a great start rather than die in a sea of hype. <laughs> right, and just one point to add is, I think having uh, that definition of a permissionless open source database is what it should be and what it is in many ways right now, but we are seeing, especially in some areas like supply chains, other you know corporate interests come in and wanting the blockchain to be more permissioned and less open. And I think if we don't want to replicate some you know existing um, economic structures that don't necessarily encourage innovation, we have to be very careful about this uh, yes. and maintain that definition because we are in an eva uh, innovation stage where it is still being shaped, and it's very important to uh, to make uh, what we expect from blockchain very clear right now. Jim, you've been very so, patient. So I'm, no, I'm just taking it all in. Now, I'm kind of just a simple professor in the business school. Oh, you know, yeah. It's the guy from Oklahoma running his AI yeah. machine learning company. But so here's okay. one, Do you do an AI company? Right. I hear you do an AI here's, company. Here's one way to think about it, right? You know, Facebook is out there trying to connect people, right? And so what does blockchain do? It connects people's data to each other. And everybody has a copy of this data. So, you know, presumably if you have a node, you have a copy of this data. So that this, this is nice because there's a lot of transparency. There's a lot of integrity of these transactions. I think one of the really uh, innovative things is how consensus is sort of, you know, how it occurs, right? So you start adding more blocks and blocks and blocks. But if you have more than 51% of the power, you can add blocks faster so you can control that blockchain, right? So I think that's interesting. The tension I see actually when people try to implement blockchain is that, you know, sometimes people don't want to share their data with the world. So then you have these corporations, these government entities, and so forth, and they want to sort of figure out how to use blockchain, maybe with just a couple of friends or, you know, people that they trust, right? So I see that as sort of, you know, coming through. That's where the tension is. Uh, the other thing is, um, you know, I, I, I'm, we always, we know about the crowd and how smart the crowd is and all this other stuff. And, you know, I think when the Bitcoin paper came out, you know, every, everyone thought the crowd was going to, you know, do good stuff, right? But, the, you know, the more I think about the crowd, you know, I always ask myself, could the crowd have organized to create something like Goldman Sachs, right? Could it have organized to create something like the World Bank? 
or even IBM? And you know, I don't think so. So there, you know, there's, there's some sort of benefit not being part of the crowd, right? And so you know, these are the things I'm, I'm sort of thinking about and struggling with. Um, I did my, uh, my mining, my mining uh, experience. My mining experience is really funny. I had to find a really high power research assistant to help me set up these mines. He came out of the local high school. <laughs> and so we set up an Ethereum mine. We had five GPUs, and we're running it. And it generates a lot of heat, which is kind of fun. And so we put it in his basement. And then during the uh, winter months, we actually moved it into his living room because you know his, his family could get some heat from it. And it, you know it's running now, and oh, it's a lot of fun. The crypto kitties are on there, and it's it's capturing everything. But um, you know, depending on how Ethereum Ether the price is, it's either profitable or not so profitable. So it's actually pretty interesting. I think it was mentioned before. The economics are very important to incentivize people to hold up these nodes and so forth. And I don't think Bitcoins would have taken off if they didn't get the economics correct, right? So that's another thing that, you know, I think 2017 was the year when everyone sort of rushed into it. And, you know, there was a, a big bubble, obviously. But, you know, 2018, we're still looking for the use case of blockchains that's going to be better than Bitcoins and Ethereum. But I think we're still searching for that. And, you know, it, we're, we're in the early stages of this game. But what's fascinating about this is making everyone think creatively about what they could do. And so you have this amazing amount of energy coming from you know, uh, companies pivoting, right? student entrepreneurs trying to change the world, and even organizations. And I think that's you know, one of the real benefits. People are, are rethinking the way that you know, business and you know, societies run. I do want to clarify one thing just to make sure everyone realizes. So you can have a permission network, so something where you're not letting everyone in the world in there, and it can still be open right. source. So something like Hyperledger, where you're based on the Golang, you know, all sorts of open source languages and databases, but it's still permission. So I just want to make sure of that because that's being something that's looked into more. And more. Listen, let's be clear about something that's really, I think, framing for all this, which is, as we saw in the history of the internet and what we now see, uh, when you have an amazing distributed technology, uh, it's going to result in it's going to result in a conflict between the trend towards monopolization that occurs and the trends towards democratization. And you know, the challenge for all of us, I think, is is how do you how do you manage both? And the challenge, frankly, for politicians is when do they grab the stick and fly the plane, and when do they just let the plane fly itself? And this is what I mean. I I think that the level of misunderstanding. How many of you saw Mark Zuckerberg's testimony to Congress? So I'm firmly of the belief that most of the people in Congress think the internet is a bunch of strings connected by tin cans. <laughs> and, and this is the interesting thing about the whole blockchain phenomenon. The regulators and the government know that a lot of the tools that they've used to centralize political and economic control are at risk, but they don't know why, they don't know how. You know, it's, what do you think? It's, it seems like we're at an interesting moment right now where the, the people are saying, uh oh, like this, the SEC right now with the ICO phenomenon, We've got to crack down on ICOs. They're very unhappy and concerned because, you know, people are investing and maybe it's not regulated. What do you guys think? I mean, is that really what's going on here that, that this technology? Now, look, first of all, in a corporate environment and in a national security context, a government having a distributed database that has integrity in a closed wall without any is a very valuable thing. I could see where there are enormous corporate use cases for blockchain on its own. But as a tool for social change, do you think that at the moment it's in, it's in a finely balanced state or is the genie out of the bottle and is it too late? Right. I think there is this uh, so an interesting quote actually by John Oliver. I don't know if you watched uh, his show, but he says um, blockchain is everything you don't understand about the internet combined with everything you don't understand about money. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is exactly what gover how governments feel not just about Bitcoin but about about blockchain. Not just in developing countries, but all around the world, as we've seen in the U.S. And that's a very worrying trend because. I know talking about regulations often makes uh, developers in the private sector sort of shiver and they, they get worried, but you do need uh, the regulatory environment. It is a 
key determinant of uh, suc the success of a uh, blockchain venture. Um, if you don't have, for instance, in blockchain supply chains, harmonious rules over different countries, it's going to be a big problem. Um, so the work we are trying to uh, build capacity within government uh, through workshops where, uh, so that they not only have their own blockchain projects, but they also understand and can input um, a blockchain into their own regulations. Uh, but it is, as you mentioned, there's a long way to go. And that's, for me, is a very worrying trend because governments are, is, are the actors that are going to ensure um, the smaller stakeholders are included in the development of the blockchain. Um, and that, to me, is the key for innovation and to keep it open source and, um, and permissionless. Mm -hmm. I think it's the 80-20 rule. So mm -hmm. I think only 20% is the technology. 80% is the governance. Mm -hmm. And um, you know what I think is going to help as well are some of the um, groups that are getting into blockchain now are forming industry consortia. So you have something like B3I in the insurance area, where lots of you know, companies are coming together and they're forming you know, regulations. They're taking it as a, a whole piece to the government. Um, I think that's where some of the key is, is more and more these industry groups coming together. And, and there are some country governments that are taking uh, still fairly limited steps, but steps nonetheless. Um, you know, you, you mentioned uh, land uh, deeds and, and titles. It's a particularly interesting example, um, you know, that the, what you talked about in terms of the example of uh, sort of explaining blockchain through deeds works very well in a system where you trust the government and uh, trust all of the actors uh, in, in the whole um, uh, value chain. If you think about a country or a region where not all of the actors are trusted, um, Jim, if you own a beautiful lakefront property in, say, the country of Georgia, and I say, you know what, I really want that beautiful lakefront property, my cousin happens to work in the land registry office. Just take it. I just take it. So mm -hmm. the country of Georgia saw that and actually moved their land registry onto the blockchain. There have been a couple of other countries that are taking that uh, a similar type of step. And I think by having country governments actually take, or in, and state and local governments are still in the fairly early exploratory stages, um, there's actually a uh, voting pilot that is happening currently in, in uh, the West Virginia primary. So there are governments that are actually taking steps to put some government functions onto blockchains. And I think the more those use cases occur, the more they're successful, the more people are learning about them. Uh, it helps to, to de-risk blockchain applications from a government perspective. And I do think that getting government actors, for the reasons that you mentioned, involved in the process um, is actually critically important. So I'm, I'm encouraged by some of those still relatively preliminary um, pilots, but I think things are moving in the right direction. Do you think that one of the things that's driving this, uh, it just struck me, we're drowning in a sea of crap on the internet right now, right? I mean, it's just clickbait crap. So, that the, so literally we're at a point right now where it's cheaper to put out crap than it is to put out it, real information. We're in an arms race with stupidity on the internet. So then, you know, distribution of misinformation. Do you think that some people uh, on a some meta level are excited about blockchain because you can't bullshit data? Well, um, <clears throat> Oh, I want to clarify something that you mentioned and kind of respond to that. In the earlier, there we go. In, in, in the earlier panel discussion, you know, I asked a question, you know, just about kind of governance and, and one of the fundamentals about governance, right, is that you can, you can regulate um, and what you need is uh, enforcement and the ability to kind of trust that enforcement, right? So there's some sort of harmonious, you know, consequence if you don't do it, right? So, so one of the benefits and what, what you had said is if you got a node, you've got the data, but don't, don't, let's just not, there also has to be good information. You don't actually have the data, you have a hashing, you have a hash that represents data. You can put data on it, but you don't necessarily have the data, right? So even telling that to the Hill and getting up there and sharing that is, is one of the fundamental things. And I mentioned earlier, uh, for startups, everybody wants to have a Delaware corporation, and that's because, gosh, the body of law is mm -hmm. pretty strong there, right? But where do you go to enforce uh, a word that's part of a smart contract? And I was at uh, Bitcoins in the Beltway. Jason King did that, I think, four years ago, and there was a, there was a startup there that was like, like arbitrage coin or something, and it was basically putting the... Um, I, well, I want to say that they were getting judges or trying to find advocates who could make rulings about 
uh, disagreements with blockchain and Bitcoin based things. And as you became more popular with rulings, then more of the challenges around that would go to you and you would have a coin or something that would represent your arbitrage ruling, which I thought was an interesting concept, right? So, so somehow someone's interpreting it, but, but even for a smart contract to work and take data in, you're a big data machine learning guy, right? So if I create a smart contract that's ingesting in a, 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 a uh, sorry about that, a million pieces of data a day about temperature plus X data plus land tract plus contract word. If someone wants to argue about what the temperature is, then a court may have to decide what Celsius means in two different languages, regardless of whether that's put on the blockchain or not. So we still have this dependence on some sort of governance mm -hmm. that has to get figured out even for a smart contract to work, right? So that's one of the challenges, right? And then you go through the cycle, right? So take autonomous cars. They're going to be great. They're going to do stuff. I'm a car guy. So, but we're probably going to have some regulation that's reactionary, some stuff that's put on startups to make it work. A bunch of people get accidentally killed and hurt and robbed in these cars potentially. And then finally we'll have a phase where it actually is working, but it might not be as fast until it goes through the cycle that the U.S. has, which is uh, enforcement, regulation, dollars spent on it, some Supreme Court battles, and then finally we can operate, have the freedom to operate and big money can come in and really kind of capitalize on that. So I think that hasn't been solved yet. So I think that's one of the challenges is blockchain is great, but we still have to have enforcement that comes from regulators, and then there has to be some tests based on our, you know, constitution. Hmm. Uh, Jonathan, I think you're right that people are, they want trust because yeah. of everything going on in the news now. And so if you think about the romaine lettuce scare, huh. just <laughs> yeah. reason, I mean, terrible, terrible thing. So um, if there was blockchain behind that, um, there's a lot of work going on now in food safety, for instance. Mm -hmm. And just the fact that you'd be able to trust and do the provenance, birth to death, of, of some of these food things to catch it early enough puts that level of trust, perfect use case to you know, gain that trust. Mm -hmm. and I actually want to push back a little bit on the notion that you can't bullshit data. Um, you absolutely can bullshit data. And I think one of the big challenges with blockchain is that data is wonderfully secure once it's on a blockchain. Depending on how data is written onto a blockchain, what its provenance is, whether there are bad actors involved, whether there are typos involved, anything that happens off-chain, unless it is controlled, unless it's governed, unless it's, I don't mean regulated and, you know, big R regulated, but unless there are, are rules around how it happens, protocols. and unless, the protocols, exactly, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, and unless there is some sort of quality control for the data going onto a blockchain, having data on the blockchain doesn't actually solve data quality control problems. I think it's a huge challenge in space. I think that a lot of people view from the outside and they look at people involved in blockchain and think they're all a bunch of utopianists. They, you know, it's a bunch of don't want regulation, don't want responsibility, technology to solve the problems. But yet what I'm hearing is, yes, this is, and we're going to talk about use cases, this is a way to solve some really big problems. But it's a tool that's going to be used by human beings. And as Jefferson used to said, you know, if men weren't devils, we wouldn't need, we wouldn't need government. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so, so I just want to, you know, say a couple of words here. Um, it kind of reminds me of, I, I don't know if you guys remember uh, Michael Milken. Does anybody remember? Oh, yeah. Right. So he, he said if he had to uh, back up his life and do it all over again, the only thing different that he would do is go make more friends down in D.C. with the regulators, right? <laughs> so, so I, you know, this is kind of, you know, what I see when I see these startups coming out. It's the one, those companies are paying attention to the regulators and working hand in hand with them. Um, those are the ones that are going to sort of uh, lay down the groundwork for launching something significant, right? The ones who are trying to sort of skirt the issues and these laws and all this other things, I don't think they have sort of, you know, viability in the long run. They, they, they may raise some ICO money now, but, you know, so, you know, one of the things to think about if you're trying to launch your own business here is absolutely work with the regulators, uh, talk to them, educate them. Um, because we're so close, we're like literally in D.C., that makes a lot of sense to me. The other thing to think about is um, there are a lot of startups, and this is one big investment in R&D, <laughs> right? So, you know, th this is a white paper. It's basically an idea. Now, as we all know, the majority of startups don't make it. I'd say 90% of them don't make it, right? It's just so hard to build a business, right? You may have the best technology and the best team, and you may be too early. And that happens with a lot of smart folks, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's not like all of them are fraud. No, it's just really hard to, you know, yes, there's some frauds in there, but it's really hard to build a business. So, I mean, you have to sort of understand it from the investor's perspective that, you know, the, the hit rate is not going to be very high because these are such early stage companies, right? And so, you know, I think that's kind of lost. The, the other thing I want to mention is a lot of people are doing really good stuff with this technology. 
it's not like trying to get rich quick. I mean, there, there are a lot of people who are using blockchain for social good, and there's a wonderful, like World Bank does a ton of stuff. I'm sure IBM does a ton of stuff on this. Um, and I think that's, that's great. And we have an advantage here in DC versus in Silicon Valley. They're using all their technology there to understand customers and sell more stuff to them. And so all their best minds are like trying to do recommendation engines and this kind of stuff. But here in DC, I mean, you know, we can use this blockchain technology for you know, the betterment of society and so forth. So I think we have a huge advantage in that sense here. Right, and just building on, on that and on the points on data and trust, uh, I think it's also very really important to remember that blockchain cannot solve anything. There are some problems that are better solved by, uh, with uh, other technologies like M-Pesa and FinTech, uh, and there are some problems that just cannot be solved uh, very simply by either blockchain or other technologies. Like um, recently I was in Vietnam for a blockchain project and we were talking with a woman-led firm, an SME, uh, who has to go through about five to seven audits per year from her buyers uh, that all want their own sustainability criteria met and we thought oh you know this is great uh, it's a trust problem this can obviously be resolved through blockchain mm -hmm. and but talking with the different stakeholders uh, we realized it wasn't necessarily a trust problem it was just competition uh, basic you know human competition and human uh, mentality issues in which even if you had a blockchain with complete trust in each company's audits the companies would still want their own personal audits made so it wouldn't save any time or produce any efficiencies for the for the supplier um, so it's just important to focus really on blockchain on the solution itself and not trying to apply desperately the technology to to every issue just because it's a hammer doesn't mean everything's a nail basically. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, 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 I do think I just add that with IoT and sensors yeah. and artificial intelligence mm. working along with blockchain, that's going to help in some helps aspects. A lot. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, let's take our conversation now to some of the ways that you're working with blockchain now, and and, and the things and the areas where you're seeing real opportunity for revolutionary change uh, by using this technology. Let's let's now talk about the use cases. Uh, Fanny, I, I stopped you before. Now that you're, let's start riffing. What, what are you excited about? And what are you working on where you really see where blockchain is going to change the conversation? All right, yeah. So I could give two examples uh, on a project I've been working on uh, right now um, in supply chains. Um, so just to give the context, there are a lot of trade preferences that are given to exporters in developing countries to export to developed countries at, with no tariffs, basically, uh, so to facilitate those exports. The problem is that most SMEs and small, small businesses in these countries just don't have the legal capacity uh, or the, the, the time to deal with the 15 or 30 different documents that you have to submit to 20 different agencies in the, um, exporting in the importing country. Um, so what blockchain can do is the farmer, for instance, the coffee farmer in Vietnam can just send a text uh, through his or her blockchain identity saying, okay, I, I'm selling this uh, bag of sustainable coffee to the buyer and then the entire movement is recorded in the blockchain so that at the point of the border of the customs the farmer or the processor does not have to submit any kind of documentation. It's all uh, automated and the tariff preferences are granted automatically. So SMEs can export to international markets more easily and customs um, also have less time to spend on verifying the entire documentation. So it's a time saver and a cost saver for everyone. Um, and this is uh, integrating basically uh, smart contracts on, uh, uh, sorry, regulation in smart contracts on the blockchain. Another example that I've been working on um, in supply chain is um, eliminating the middlemen in the supply chains that basically provide no actual value, but just, <laughs> just uh -oh. you know, check, well, <laughs> they just check, you know, documentation and verify that it's valid and make the link between different actors. And they take a lot of the final revenue or mm. the final value of the good, which means a lot of that revenue doesn't actually go to the farmer, it's himself or herself. Um, so what actually a colleague of mine at the World Bank is trying to do is setting up sort of an Amazon-like service for supply chains. Mm in which, again, the farmer is just sends a text about, oh, I have a box of bingos uh, in Haiti, um, and a service provider arranges with local contractors to bring the box of mangoes directly 
from the farmer to the final consumer. And that eliminates a lot of the inefficiencies in the blockchain. Uh, the customer has complete transparency about what share of the revenue went to the farmer compared to other uh, normal supply chains in which there were 30 different intermediaries. Um, so it's increasing revenues for the farmers and it's increasing transparency uh, uh, for the consumer and so building a new sort of social contract by creating that direct link. And Fanny, I'll add to that. So does anyone have an idea with let's say one shipping container on a huge ship, how many documents need to be put together for that one shipping container? It's like, Two. I'm sorry? <laughs> that was a good guess. I, it's I like, like 300, 300 <laughs> documents for the one shipping container. So it costs more in many cases for processing of those documents than what you're actually shipping. Um, perfect example, so IBM actually just did this joint venture with Maersk Shipping, um, so a whole new company that's just been announced um, where they're gonna market that and um, sell that blockchain. That's really cool. Yeah, I think yeah. it's 7% of the global value of trade annually that's spent in documentation costs, yeah. which is a lot. It's, it's, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. And I, where else are we seeing it? Or what are we excited about it? Well, you, you hear are the classic ones, right? I mean, financial services, settlement, clearance, capital markets, stock trades. There's a guy from the DTCC here, and you know we put a lot of just stock, stock certificates in a in a warehouse in New Jersey, and so you know the whole idea of of issuing securities on the blockchain and using smart contracts to manage these. So that's a pretty obvious one that's got a lot of attention on it right now. Um, as a publicly traded company, you know we're looking at you know the things that 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 can can actually you know derive value. And so one of the things that that you know I always try to there was a paper about kind of fat protocol, thin protocol a while ago that compared the evolution of the internet to the evolution of blockchain. And that is that we're still in you know a lot of the value in uh, internet companies came from thin protocol, right? Just HTTP and you know transfer of packets of information. The real fat layer was the applications on top of that. But right now we're with, with blockchain, we're in a little bit of a reverse mode. It's kind of fat protocol. It's all the, you know, completely changing some of the infrastructure where some of these systems and information work together. So, uh, and there was a lot of people early on, the guys that made the pipes and Cisco and routers and stuff on the early days that made, still made a ton of money, right? Mm -hmm. So we might not yet be able to apply it from a, from a creating value perspective. Um, social good and some of these things that IBM's exploring. I've got some life science background, so I was listening to a project that was um, counterfeit drugs, right? So the custody yeah. of information about the actual, you know, initial element that goes into the drug, where it's manufactured, where it goes to, and then and then how it's distributed, right? That's a big problem. And of course, we know big pharma's got a lot of money and a lot of lobbyists, right? So if they can figure out a way to put that on the blockchain, that's really interesting. <clears throat> But like identity, that's one that people have really kind of really struggled with. It just seems like, oh gosh, let's put identity on the blockchain. But it's still, it's still a, a difficult challenge, right, to kind of harmonize what your identity is. Since how deep does it go? Could I was working on a project a couple of years ago that we were going to, um, they actually won the Lean Startup Contest. I think it was where you spit in a cup and they basically would take your DNA and then we put it into a research thing and they tell you a little bit if you, if you wanted to know, they tell you if you had some bad disease. If not, you're just volunteering your DNA for research. And I was proposing that we could actually allow you to track whether or not you wanted your DNA information to be used for a clinical trial, whether it was for uh, something good or something just a lifestyle drug, you could control your information, right? So now imagine putting that in there, now so that that's happening, right? So people are looking at how to control everything about your DNA and maybe, you know, for, for as long as computers can keep it, information, your DNA can be used in a trial to discover something. So those are the things that are, are kind of interesting and blockchain might be able to improve. Um, on the uh, identity front, um, going, going back to the social good use cases, um, the, um, I believe it's the UN World Food Program has a, a really interesting pilot. So um, thinking about identity, we all have presumably driver's licenses if we drive, if we've left the country, we have a passport. If you're Canadian like me, you have one to be here. Um, if you're a refugee, if you have left your home country, what sort of identification do you have? What sort of affiliation do you have with a state that might be able to say, yes, you are this person? Uh, so refugees actually don't really have access to anything that sort of guarantees their identity. Uh, what the World, World Food Program is doing um, in uh, some of its refugee camps, they have stores in the refugee camps, so people who are living in these refugee camps are able to go and, and get food. 
There's existing technology, so there's uh, iris scans that are already in place to ident uniquely identify people. What they are now doing to reduce transaction costs, and it is really primarily to reduce transaction costs, is tying those iris scans and tying the identity management to a blockchain and then tying the benefits that individuals who are in these refugee camps are able to get and spend in the uh, stores to get provisions. Um, so what's now happening is essentially um, cashless transactions that are using cryptocurrency, uh, that are using iris scans to uniquely identify people. But one of the benefits of tying that onto a blockchain is if somebody moves from one camp to another, their identity is able to go with them. So this is, it's still very, very early days for that variety of identity management. Um, you know, we were talking before about defining blockchains and do they have to be open, public, and permissionless. Uh, some of the, and you can imagine in, in uh, unstable states, um, they're an organization like the UN in this particular case is using a private permission blockchain and there's some questions about that. Yeah. Um, but there are some, some, there's some huge potential in being able to do things like identity management and tie those identity management um, components to financial transactions. Sounds to me like there's an enormous opportunity here. Um, it, so a number of the use cases you described, if everybody involved in the chain actually was interested in having the information freely available, you could do it under current models. Yeah. But the challenge is that a lot of people are currently use technology to create wall gardens, right? And we try to get a Facebook uh, posting for a, an event you're having out to your friends without Facebook asking you for money, for example. Uh, so is this really a situation where we were talking earlier about big regulators versus democracy, where the technology will literally force people to, it'll, it'll put intermediaries out of the business if in fact their only business is to capture and hold information and extract value. Yes, so theor theoretically I think you're correct. I think the blockchain has uh, the potential to um, knock out all the middlemen in any industry. So you can pick an industry and even like teaching, you can knock me out, right? <laughs> I'm sort of no, the middleman. No, knock out the deans when that's okay. <laughs> But, you know, what I wanted to sort of talk about is, um, you know, some of the um, blockchain technology that I'm working on right now. So, for example, there's some uh, two students out of Johns Hopkins undergraduate, really talented young, young men. Uh, we're actually using the IBM uh, Hyperledger fabric, and we're creating, they're creating Yik Yak, but a clean version of Yik Yak where you can be anonymously posting up things around Johns Hopkins, what's going on. Uh, the other thing that I'm working on um, is Block Med X, and so we're trying to use blockchains and AI in order to solve the opioid crisis, right? Hmm. And then, of course, I have to do one just to try to make some money. And, you know, I do these things, one, to learn, but also I think it's, I think if you do it correctly, then you can build a reputation, right? A lot of people try to just jump and try to get rich very quickly. And so we're gonna put um, real estate properties and the cash flows and the income onto um, you know, a token, a securitized asset token. And we're gonna do everything correctly, right? And you know, we're not there to put you know, Mr. Wonderful type buildings on there. We're, we're gonna put small little properties and see if we can get some traction. And you know, one of the things that we're thinking about is there's a lot of empty um, space in a building down in the basement. And so can you put in miners in there? Can you create an economy where institutional investors can say, oh, this is great. This is the blockchain. I can actually see it, right, and f physically feel it. You know, the, I think the mining is an excellent sort of thing, business right now. You can tell your student, I'll host those five miners for you, you know, because you deal in that, you know, no problem with that. <laughs> So, so, you know, those are the things I'm working on. Um, I think industries that this technology will really disrupt is government and healthcare. And so th those, those are ones are right for, dis um, because of the data is there and so forth. Yeah, and I'll add one thing, you know, the, the middleman story is a good one, but I think it was Mark Andreessen who had the quote even before blockchain, right, which is, hey, hey middleman, watch out, software is coming for you. I think it's, it's something like that. Yeah. So that was already happening prior to blockchain, right? If you're an intermediary, you're a broker or a car dealer or you're doing something else, it's already happening because that really created a universal way to exchange information so that that middleman is, is getting squeezed. So the margins on just saying, I have information about something that has supply and demand on other sides of it. Is, is already happened, right? So the blockchain maybe just does a way of storing that information better um, or storing those transactions for verification, right? So, so right. Yeah, I was right. gonna add a funny story about the intermediaries. So several years ago, I was called to a bank in Canada and they wanted to know about blockchain, you know, really 
the early days and still learning. And so I was getting all ready to talk to them about all the introductory stuff. Well, it ends up it was a department of auditors, and they called me in because they were worried about their jobs. <laughs> so basically, I say, you know what, it, your jobs will change. It's not necessarily that you will be removed, you just might change. Um, I wanted to also give um, one interesting use case that also was from a few years ago. So IBM Global Financing, um, IBM figured that in the very beginning when they're first getting into blockchain, we better do something ourselves, right? <laughs> or this will not make sense, we better try this out first. And so our global financing, if you buy something, um, you get involved with how to finance it. And it was, if there were disputes going on, like someone didn't agree with the price or they weren't billed the right way, um, anybody know how long that might take to resolve? It was, it's, it's, this is embarrassing. It took over 44 days for one to resolve. So they were able to put that all on the blockchain, just do a couple nodes of suppliers at first, get that down to just a few days. So that's a typical benefit that um, can make a huge, huge difference in the, the billions that they save doing that. And the, you know, this idea of you know, asset-backed tokens, and for getting into use cases, right, the idea that I can, you know, I can bifurcate and fraction out ownership of something, right? So you know, a piece of art, well, physically does have to be somewhere, right? Even if like 1,000 people or 100,000 people own one you know, bit of some asset, right? So that model is happening, right? So everything from just revenue streams, uh, collection, contracts and stuff into physical assets. I think that's really interesting. But, but in the end, the, the physical asset does have to be somewhere. Even if the, the asset has been tokenized, there's an exchange that will exchange that and let you trade it. And its value then is just derived by supply and demand about the asset itself and the people that are interested in it. But, but physically, it still has to be somewhere. Which brings us to the last thing before I let you go, which is that what you just described, Charlie, I think is the thin edge of the wedge of uh, the whole conversation around is blockchain basically an enablement for cryptocurrencies and it, you know yesterday I think I was reading it was either in Slate or Wire somebody said that that Bitcoin and blockchain is just a fraud you know and uh, at least one major investment bank published a report recently probably self-serving that said that half of all ICS data fraudulent so how, how do you react to, to that um, not me, confrontation. I went out on CNN. How do you react to that? Well, and we get the point. But what's your, there is clearly going to be a regulatory backlash. We're seeing it, it's inevitable. Um, will this collapse under its own weight or will it survive and how will it survive? No. I started doing some research in cryptos and bitcoins and so forth, and uh, even in the business school, you know, there's some faculties that they got really all fired up. <laughs> like, what are you doing? It's fraud. It's a fraud, right? I said, no, 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 no. Take a look at it, research it, you know, think about it. Don't think so much about bitcoins and what, you know, these pundits are saying. Think about the blockchain and understand the technology behind it. And then sort of, you know, come back to me and tell me what you, you think. And to be honest, the first time I heard about bitcoins, a student told me, hey, Professor Liu, you should really look at the Bitcoins. And I just regurgitated what Jamie Dimon said. I said, no, no, I, that's a fraud. Hmm. And I dismissed the poor guy very quickly. But he, you know, he, he was very persistent. He said, no, 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 Professor Liu, take a look at it. Look at it, you know, understand it, so, you know, think about it, and see what it can do. And so if anyone spends time thinking about it, reading papers on the internet and so forth, it's like an amazing thing that's going to happen, right? And so like a lot of people who, who are initially sort of um, apprehensive to understand or even sort of you know, go towards the Bitcoin direction or the blockchain direction, it's usually because they didn't spend that much time on it, right? And so I've, I've noticed that the more, the, the more that you sort of dig in there and research it and think about it, the more bullish you become. <laughs> and you know, it, it, it's kind of interesting. So it's almost like how much time did you spend researching and thinking about it? And then you know, how excited do you get about it, right? And um, yeah, so you know, for, for those who are interested, you know, absolutely, I encourage you guys. For, for those who think it's a fraud, and you know, there's a lot of folks out there. You know, I just encourage you to do a little bit more research, right? And think about it a little bit open, more, more open-minded, and don't get so emotional about it. <laughs> I was just going to say that um, I still think that when I get clients who talk about that, you know, I, I do try and explain the differences with permissioned and. Um, not the some of the risks with the crypto. I also say, you know, IBM sometimes is not very um, is is pretty risk averse, right? and the fact that they've basically created a startup within themselves, which has grown to this huge division now, I think says something. 
Right, and I think in any in new technology or mm -hmm. any initiative like that, there will be fraud and there will be busts. Uh, but I think one thing you know from the panel today is you can see there are also a lot of really good applications mm -hmm. and blockchain in many ways if it's used right. And I think regulators do actually have a role to play in making sure of that can be, for instance, a big accelerator for the UN sustainable uh, sustainable development goals. Um, when you think, for instance, that about three percent of development aid is just siphoned off to non-development uh, related use. Um, if you can use blockchain to sort of track those funds, um, I think you actually had Phil and Ted, right, uh, yep. an initiative on, on this. Yep. Um, this can be represent enormous savings. Um, so it's there, are, there will be fraud, but you can also choose to focus on the uh, social and good applications of it. And, and there absolutely has been fraud, right? And there have been sort of some completely ridiculous ICOs. And I think there's been a lot, a lot of the news coverage is of the things that are either fraudulent or people running drug money through Bitcoin or all of the, the sort of more nefarious, in some ways those are sexier stories. Um, I don't know if anybody heard about this when it happened, but the, there was a company uh, called the Long Island Ice Tea Company. Did you guys hear about this? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, and if anybody didn't hear about it, they uh, rebranded as um, uh, Long Blockchain. Yeah, right. <laughs> and they're, uh, they're, they were at risk of being uh, delisted from NASDAQ and their stock price increased uh, over 200% just with the, the branding change. So, you know, there, there, there are reasons to, for the average person to be a little bit wary, but I think the more that we can get the use cases out there, I, I'm personally more excited about blockchain than I am about crypto. I think there is opportunity in crypto. Um, but the possibility of blockchain, and partially just as blockchain as sort of a forcing function um, to address some of the people challenges, some of the organizational challenges, some of the structural challenges, and then figure out how the technology can be, uh, can best serve whatever the need is, whether it's a business need or a social need, has tremendous potential. The more that we can get those stories out there, the more that there's conversation. I do think there's going to be something of a market correction, um, but I, I, I don't think that it's going to collapse under the weight of the hype. Well, any final words? Charlie, you're grabbing the mic. The floor is you yours. I have all the mics. Actually. I have all the mics. You've got all the mics. <laughs> well, so I'm going to go like, hey, okay. so what if you move on from selling plasma, you're Holy now selling cow. microphones. What, is this, what does this say about me? Uh, well, look, I mean, I'm. I'm a mentor at Accelerate DC. I've, I've heard you know hundreds of startup pitches, right? So the idea that a, that a startup is a fraud or an ICO is a fraud, or is it really just a bad idea that you are? It was just a bad idea to begin with, and you decided to add big, like blockchain to it, and you're doing it like, hey, I've got a pizza company. We're going to put like pizza on the blockchain. How are you going to do it? Well, the order comes in, and I put it on there, and I'm like, you know what? There's no need to put no there needs, should be a permanent There's no need to put that on the blockchain, right. right? It's just not. So really, I would say this: like, yes, there's a bunch of fraud that's out there, and we all, if you read CoinDesk and stuff, there is. Actually, some serious stuff. Subpoenas have gone out. There's some discovery going on, and people are trying to figure out: Did you actually misrepresent it? Right? The U.S. government said through the Jobs Act and crowdfunding, "Hey, we want to give more access to people. It's not just the guys that get in as an LP and a fund to invest in these things, but they're still using some dated ways of, of giving access." So, my, my closing comment, you know, from 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 tokenization and, and how this goes, is is really evaluate whether that is a viable business to put on the blockchain. Be realistic about the use of a, of a, of what now is an innovative way, but it may come under some regulation, and you may have a little bit of a kitty to get your lawyer to kind of make sure you're doing something. But it, it, it's going to be something. But really test, do you have a, fundamentally, do you have a business idea right now that could benefit from verification and distribution and that? Do you have a little bit of an understanding on it? Do you have some folks, if you're in DC, you need to have some folks to invest in it because if people don't write checks very much right here, right? We know that, Jonathan. So that'd be my closing comment. It might not be a fraud. It might just be a bad idea. And, and just really vet your ideas and exercise them in an MVP model. And then incorporate blockchain if you really think that. And, and then get ready to start paying for those developers. Because by the way, we're looking, everybody's looking. If you want to find the hardest thing to find right now, find a, a, a good developer on Solidity or these other things that are going to write stuff. And IBM's hiring a bunch of people. They're hard to find. Eastern Europe, go all around. They're really hard to find right now. Send your kids to code school, for God's <laughs> sakes. Enough of this liberal arts stuff. Tell them not to read Aerosmith and open up a code book. Well, I want to tell you, this was a really, really instructive panel. Thank you very much for doing this.